Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well this week. Um, we are moving along in this semester and um, this week what we're going to be doing is adding on to some of the knowledge that we have already uh, developed with this particular objective. So the objective we're going to look um, into this week is identify and explain styles of visual arts from a variety of times, places, and cultures. And Weekly, I've been giving you some featured artists to uh, take a look at and critique and talk about. And to add and build on to that, I want to talk about art movements. Now, you can have an entire semester-long class on art movements, and I am certainly not an expert on all art movements, but I am going to um, provide you with some general art movements that you should be aware of that you could incorporate into your um, lessons if you're going to be teaching art in the classroom. And so um, we'll go through that. And then this understanding the art movements is going to be able to help you do some other things like understand and interpret cultural meaning of art, uh, mask making, and other uses of art and culture, um, to see various patterns um, within cultures, places, and time periods. And then we're going to be doing a piece on talking about how there's a connection between culture, museum, schools, and art. And so having an understanding of some of the basic art movements will help you understand um, the interdisciplinary nature of multicultural art. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. All right, let's begin by talking about what an art movement actually is. According to this definition, it's a tendency or style within a specific common philosophy or goal, and it usually happens um, in a set time period and by a certain group of artists. So a couple of other things that you should note about an art movement to make it more clear is art movements are essentially a modern system of categorizing art. Um, it was created by you know, art critics and historians. They wanted to look back in time and be able to discuss the art, so they gave each period a, a, a specific movement name. Art movements um, seem to be uh, a Western art phenomena. You don't see it with um, Eastern or and, and any other cultures really giving these art movements. Um, and art movements really help viewers critique and understand art in context. So what you're doing is you're comparing, you know, um, a similar piece of work to another piece of work, and that allows you to do it in context. All right, now we're going to dive in and talk about some common art movements. This list is not exhaustive. Uh, I tried to cover... Um, different time periods that I thought would make sense for you to know, but there are many, many different art movements that are not covered in these, um, in these notes. But let's start off with exploring the Renaissance. Okay, the Renaissance. So the Renaissance is a very long period. It's from 1400 to 1550. And within that um, period, there are a lot of subcategories. For, for instance, like the early Renaissance or the Italian Renaissance. Um, the, the term Renaissance actually means rebirth. And at this time, the artists wanted to go back to the classical ideas of um, ancient Rome and Greece. The other important part of the Renaissance period is that um, people wanted to depict the human figure in, uh, you, you know, anatomically and scientifically correctly. So that's, that's what they would do during that time. Um, this actually, this time period raised the status of an artist for being somebody that's just, you know, poor and, and not that important to being on par with writers and philosophers. And then the classical content of the Renaissance period is looking at the human figure or looking at religious figures. Like, for instance, you'll see pictures of Madonna or baby Jesus or angels. This is the School of Athens by Raphael. And in this painting, you can see that everything looks very realistic. You can see the composition is very centered. There's a focal point. Um, you know, you, the human figure is as realistic as possible, so this is a good example of the Renaissance period art. Some other uh, paintings from the Renaissance per period that you might be familiar with would be the Mona Lisa by da Vinci, uh, Primavera, 
uh, by Sandro uh, Botticelli and The Creation of a Adam by Michelangelo. And again, pay attention to the figures. It's predominantly religious figures that you're seeing or the figures are done as anatomically correct or scientifically correct as possible. The next art movement that I want to talk about is neoclassicism. And I, w I wanted to offer this as, as one example of an art movement because it's kind of the bridge between the Renaissance and, um, and Romanticism. So neoclassicalism, you know, during this uh, time period, there was a lot of emphasis on painting things that were ethical or classical or patriotic. Um, there was a very um, careful application of the paint, and there was a very um, uh, sy symmetrical um, composition in it. Colors tended to be, you know, somber and flat, and, you know, everything was running parallel to the actual painting. Okay, both of the um, paintings that I chose to um, highlight for this particular um, art movement are, were done by Jacques-Louis David, and you may have seen the one, um, Napoleon Crossing the Alps. That's more, maybe more popularly seen. Um, but I want you to just look, take a look at the paintings and notice that in these paintings, they're very realistic. Um, you can see that the lines that are used within it are very sharp and clear. Um, you know, these, these are the features of that neoclassicism. And then when we look at the next one, the Romanticism period, just kind of look and see the difference. Um, I chose this one by Socrates, or the death of Socrates, because there's this is actually um, a death or a suicide um, image. And when you look at the next one, you'll be able to compare it and see the difference. Okay, as we move into Romanticism, it's different from the Neoclassicalism because what's happening here is um, there's a lot more focus on color and stroke and texture rather than the lines. There's a lot more uh, different themes. Um, if there is a theme, it might be a biblical source at some point. Um, the, the lines in the paintings could be diagonal versus just being perpendicular to the, to the uh, bottom. Colors are more intense and bright and the figures are expressive and individualistic versus neoclassicalism. You know, it's kind of like fitting that one mold of what a person is. Okay, take a moment to kind of go back to the neoclassicalism um, image and then look at this one right here where you see um, the death by Dela Cruz. It, it, you can see a very, very clear different, difference. Both of them are kind of talking about a suicide that has occurred and you can see the images are much more um, clear with very, very distinct lines in the neoclassicalism um, portrait or image. And then in this one by Dela Cruz, things are a little bit more blurred. There's more texture. The colors are more vibrant. Um, so those are some things that you see in Romanticism. So two important things to note about this art movement realism is that at this time, the invention of photography occurred. So people were able to, at this time, not everyone, but people were able to see photographs of things, which gave a very, very realistic uh, picture of the image that they were looking at. And um, also, this is around the time of the Industrial Revolution. There's a lot of different social things that are happening. And so this is kind of, we. And it, you'll notice in these art movements that we shift between sort of getting very conservative and then getting more liberal and conservative and liberal, um, for lack of a better word, in, uh, um, in, these, in these different uh, movements. So in this case, realism, they wanted to make things look like everyday reality to show social issues, to show what was really happening. They wanted to limit artistic interpretations of what was happening, and um, this was a, a reaction kind of against Romanticism, which focused more on emotions. Here are a couple of examples of realism. The uh, one on the right and the bottom, the gleaners and plowing, they're showing agricultural realism, the life, daily life that maybe a farmer would be facing. And later on in this period, the American realist came about, 
And that one is shown up in the top left there, there the Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. And you can see all of them, even though the top one is more of a cityscape and a little more modern, you can see that they're trying to show the reality of daily life. And in the Hopper um, image, you can see some famous um, people from that time period in that image. So as I've mentioned, um, we sort of flip-flop back and forth between these art movements. And now you had um, the realism, and these new artists are sort of rebelling against that in the form of Impressionism. And what they, these Impressionists are doing is instead of trying to get things very, very accurate, they're trying to give the impression of something. So they're really analyzing color and light. Um, they don't have as much detail. There's not a realistic portrayal of the subjects. Um, the composition also here can be asymmetrical, and sometimes even something in the background can be distracting and take away from the focal point. Um, they often painted outside, and they included important figures of the time in these particular um, paintings. So in both of these paintings, you can see that um, the, there's an interpretation of the uh, image that they want to show, but it's not necessarily, you know, a very, very detailed. You can tell exactly what's happening. There's a boat on a, on a lake with the sunset, um, and then there's a boat that's right on a canal or a, a water body there, a flood that's occurring. So the details are, are not so much there, but it's giving you the impression of the image. So a group of artists that sort of rebelled against Impressionism are called the Post-Impressionists. And they don't really have necessarily one set style because you're going to see in the examples a pointillism one and then a, a Van Gogh um, painting that are pretty different from each other. But they really um, wanted to um, react to Impressionism's um, unstructured style and they felt that um, Impressionists didn't really focus on any sort of emotion or anything like that in their in their paintings. And so these particular artists really wanted to focus on the emotional, structural, symbolic, and spiritual elements of, of their um, ideas and their art. So the two paintings that I chose, um, you've probably seen these more before, A Sunday Morning um, by uh, Surratt. Uh, that is a pointillism example, and that is where the artist used little teeny tiny dots, and it's it's basically looking at how those dots can all work together to make an, a complete painting. And then I also chose uh, Van Gogh, uh, Van Gogh, um, his olive tree um, painting, and you can really see here all the different textures that he puts in. He was uh, very interested in in texture more than anything else. Okay, we'll next talk about Expressionism, and again, these, uh, these folks wanted to focus on emotional and spiritual part of the world, so that kind of goes along a little bit with the post-Impressionists, it kind of segues in there. Um, they're looking for, um, you know, a more subjective search for personal emotional truth. Um, they kind of are looking inward for self-expression, and you'll notice in these particular works of art that shapes, color, and line are used to express, express emotion. So the two examples that I chose to um, talk about expressionism were The Scream by Munch and Davos by Kirchner. And again, you'll notice in these two paintings, there's a lot of color that is used to really um, express, like in The Scream, you know, like you're expressing, oh my gosh, it's just really, ah, I want to make sure. So you've got those colors in there that are popping, but you've also got the figure who is uh, obviously under um, stress is, is, is darker. Um, with Davos, you can see the really beautiful pinks and blues um, kind of showing that there's, there's some sort of sunset that's occurring. Um, and again, just expressing emotion with those colors and lines and shapes. So an important historical perspective for Cubism is that this is occurring at the um, turn of the century and there's a lot of uh, modernization going on. So artists like Picasso, they wanted to kind of pe keep, uh, keep pace with that modern age that they were living in and they really wanted to defy 
the um, art that was done previously and they wanted to do something totally different. So they wanted to defy perspective because perspective is um, part of the of the paintings in the past that was there was a lot of emphasis put on that. And the cubist artist wanted to show um, many views of the subject at the same time. Um, they also referenced other cult cultures as inspiration, as you'll see in my example with some African art. The three exemplars in this slide are um, identifying the three kind of fathers of cubism. And um, if you'll notice in all of the paintings, there's a lot of flat surfaces, and that's kind of one thing that can help you identify cubism. And then I just put the picture down at the bottom to show you how Pablo Picasso got inspiration for his um, head of a woman from an, a, an African, uh, a West African mask. I included Dadaism. Um, you know, some would say it's not an art movement, um, but I wanted to include it in here because I think it has some um, value. So with Dada, Dadaism, um, what's happening here is, is artists were having an anti-art stance. Um, they wanted to pr provoke other artists um, to see what's going wrong in the world. This, is, this occurred with, with a time period um, near World War I where there was a lot of social and political kind of and cultural unrest and um, they wanted to include element, elements not only of visual arts but of all of the fine arts like poetry, dance, music, theater, and politics. And so you'll see um, people rebelling kind of against like social norms or things that people were holding as, as true and other people maybe thought they weren't true. So here are three examples of Dada or Dadaism. Um, and so the one I really like is the iron because I hate ironing. <laughs> and so it's kind of to me looks like it's rebelling against ironing or maybe women having to iron at that particular time period. So the surrealist were kind of rebelling against the, the Dada people because the Dada um, had a lot of neg negativity about society. But the surrealist, what they wanted to do was they wanted to explore the unconscious mind. And their goal was to liberate an artist's imagination by tapping into the unconscious and finding a superior reality or a surre surreality. Uh, surrealism, that's where they get the name. They did want to attack establishment, society, culture, and art um, with this particular movement as well. So these are the two images that I chose to represent surrealism. And both of these images have a sort of um, dream-like effect to them. You know, you see the, 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 the watches and uh, melting kind of over the different pieces in the dolly piece. So those are examples of um, surreal, surrealistic art. So a lot of times you'll hear about abstract art, um, and that's not really the correct um, terminology for it. It would be abstract expressionism. So this is a um, the first American art style that influenced art globally around the world. And the important part about abstract expressionism is the actual act of painting is just as important as the final result. So you'll see a lot of um, artwork in this case where the artist is doing things like splattering or pounding or moving with their hands and, you know, kind of vigorous movements. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of value in the, in, um, in spontaneity and personal expression and there are two different types there's action painting and there's color field painting and action painting is just what I expressed where somebody's doing something like splattering paint or throwing some, uh, you know paint against a canvas and then color field painting is where you're taking um, large swaths of the picture and you're painting it just a single color so I gave two examples of that in the next slide So the image on the left is an example of the color field painting where you just have singular colors in, in certain areas. And then you can see the Jackson Pollock painting, um, which many people say, is that really art? But he really gets into it. He's flinging paint and, and movement is, is very much a part of how, a, a, a very much an important part of how this art is created.
The final type of art movement that we're going to look at is pop, pop art. And this art is uh, it's called pop art because it's about popular culture. It's characterized by a sense of positivity and optimism. And it really um, coincided with the globalization of pop music and youth culture. Um, you know, things like when you hear Elvis Presley and the Beatles, that's that time period. Um, there's an interest in mass media and mass culture and mass production. One of the most probably famous pop artists is Andy Warhol, and of course you probably have seen his Campbell Soup uh, cans paintings. He has a series of them. This is the 32 Campbell Soups cans. Um, but you can, and then the the, uh, the painting on the um, retroactive painting on the left, you can see that there are some um, important figures of the time, some uh, big events that are shown in this particular pop culture uh, painting or collage. So that concludes our notes for today. And I know that's a very uh, cursory look at the different movements, but I wanted to just make you aware of them in case you um, are not familiar with the different movements. You can always investigate each movement a little bit more if you're interested in it. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the notes today. Okay, bye.